the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you listen closely to the gospel today? Because if you did, you would have likely realized that you could take this gospel reading and this could be the basis of your entire life. I mean that. Take this gospel home and read it every single morning when you say your prayers. That's how important this gospel is. It comes from the Sermon on the Mount. And our Lord taught many profound and completely revolutionary thoughts and teachings. So I'd like today to just go through the gospel and see exactly what our Lord said. His first part was, he says, the eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is sound, your whole body will be full of light, but if your eye is not sound, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. Now he's not talking about our physical eye. Because our physical eye is either light or dark based on whether there's sunlight or artificial light. If you've ever been in a cave before, had that experience where they turn off all the lights and you're trying desperately to see and you still can't see anything but your eyes are trying harder? That's our physical eyes. He's speaking about the eye of our perception. How we take what we see with our eyes and then understand and comprehend that in our mind, in our soul. Everything that we experience in life, everything we do is with the eye of our perception. And so we approach everything through the perception that we have. So I go into a situation and I decide, oh, that person's not happy with me, or that person's angry with me. And I make that decision based on things that I'm watching, but it's all the way that I internally perceive. And so if my internal perception is dark, if it's clouded over by anxiety or fear or anger or jealousy, we know in our life experience, if we're honest with ourselves, times where we have grossly misjudged a situation because our eye has been so darkened. And we are firmly convinced that this is exactly what's happening. But in fact, it's not. So our Lord encourages us that our eye must be sound so that our whole body will be full of light. Is our eye toward God? Is it light? Then we will see God. We'll see the light in everything. We know this is the testimony of the saints, that they see good in everything. God is good. He created a good creation. And so the saints see good in all things. But we in our darkness, we see the negative. We see the the way in which people are mistreating us or mishandling situations. And we would say spiritually that our eye has been darkened by sin and by the passions. If we had an eye of light, we would see goodness and truth and beauty in things. But then instead we see darkness and we spread that darkness by our thoughts and by our actions. St. Basil the Great spoke about a honeybee as an analogy. He was talking about um, Greek philosophy and the pre-Christian Greek writings, he said you approach it like a honeybee, going and looking for the nectar in each place, going around to the flowers. So you take what is good and what is not, what is not of God, you, you leave behind. St. Paisios took that image, the manure. Don't we approach the world like this many times? Maybe the political world, maybe the world at large in this way, looking for the trash. And if we're looking for the trash, we'll find the trash. If we're looking for the beauty and the good, we will find that. St. Paisius' feast day is tomorrow, so we should all celebrate that feast day. The next that our Lord says is, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. This is the most incriminating passage, indeed. Here is where my own hypocrisy becomes clear. I stand here and preach, but I don't have love for God. Look at what it says. Now, I'd like to say that I love God, but 
but what do I, my actions show? What do they show? If I don't want to have communion with God, then I don't have love for God. If I don't want to pray, I don't have love for God. A book that I've been reading about Elder Sergei Van Ves, he says this about that dichotomy, and it is only a dichotomy between going towards God or going away from God. He says about prayer, every undertaking done with prayer profits us, while every activity unaccompanied by prayer is sterile, even if it appears to be good. On this point, Elder Sergei calls to mind Christ's sayings, he who does not gather with me scatters. Where's the third path? There isn't one. We're either gathering or scattering. There's no standing on the sidelines. There's no sort of figuring out where do I want to be. There's gathering or there's scattering. Either we are doing the work of God or we are doing work against God. This is what our Lord is saying here. We cannot love one and love the other. So he continues forward saying right after that, therefore about loving God versus mammon. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor about your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And which of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit to his span of life? It's so obvious and yet so impossible. We know that we can do nothing nothing positive by being anxious. We know that nothing good comes from that. We know that we cannot make our outcomes better by being anxious. And yet this is what we fall to. All of us do. In varying degrees and varying times. The word anxious in Greek, it has this sense of being divided, being pulled apart. You know that sensation inside of you when you're anxious. It's like you're shooting off in all kinds of different directions. You're less able to approach the life that is before you. You become more incapable to endure the struggles that you're facing. And so it has this vicious cycle. We become more and more anxious, more and more scattered. And then that causes more anxiety because we can't figure out the things that are in front of us. Like Martha, Mary and Martha, we remember. It wasn't Martha's problem that she was serving. It wasn't Martha's problem that she was doing the good things to this great and esteemed guest in her house. But what did our Lord say? Martha, Martha, you're anxious and worried about many things. That was her problem. She was anxious and worried. And this, my brothers and sisters, anxiety is the pandemic of our society. If we didn't know it a year and a half ago, we know it now. None of us can imagine that we are immune to anxiety. If you're on the one end of the spectrum, you're, you have anxiety about all the government intervention and all the new laws and rules. If you're on the other end, you have fear and anxiety about the disease that is traveling across the world. We all suffer from anxiety. And we have all these clinical diagnoses for this. And they're on the rise. So what is at the heart of anxiety? And anxiety, by the way, it has so many effects that we know through medical science, psychological science, effects on our body, effects on our life. We can shorten our life by being anxious. We can cause all kinds of physical ailments. At the root, anxiety is the desire to control things that are out of my control. That's where anxiety comes from. Because the things that I have control over are very few. Very few. I can choose to brush my teeth in the morning. That's something I have control over. Most of the rest of my life I don't have control over, if I'm honest. And this is where the struggle is. Am I honest about what I have control over? Because if there's any anxiety, I promise you, there's something that you are trying to control that you can't control. And these may be things that you thought you could control all your life. 
As we age, we see ways in which I thought I could control that thing about my body, and I can't. Because it reminds me, my body is destined for death. And it's been destined for death from the very beginning. And that's what it's working towards. And now I'm starting to realize that, because I can't control this thing. And it causes me anxiety. And these aren't small things. I mean, you have, taking that example of the elderly, what about the decision to move into a, a nursing home? That's a very difficult thing. These aren't things that are, I'm not trying to say, oh, just turn off the anxiety and move forward. It's not easy. But we have to recognize always when there's anxiety, it's because there's something I want to control that I can't control. And it always points to our limitations, to our limitedness. I'm not God, I'm not omniscient, I'm not omnipotent, but I'm trying to be. I want to control because life is too terrifying. It's too difficult to admit that I don't have control over this thing or these things in my life. So I try to make certainties out of uncertainties. Does that sound like a good idea? That's what we do again and again. We make certainties out of uncertainties. And this strategy is doomed to failure. And then we become more anxious. We saw this clearly in the past year. We saw how all of this rises to the surface. Can we control disease? Can we control how it affects us and our loved ones? It doesn't mean that there isn't any, there aren't things that can be done, but don't have the delusion that that is going to protect us completely. Or don't have the delusion that everything is going to be within my control. We must recognize that anxiety is always, always a crisis of faith. How is it a crisis of faith? Because there's something that I want to control that I can't. And whose realm are the things that I don't have control over? God's. God is over all things. So God will be at work in those things. Does it mean that he runs everything in the world like a dictator? Of course not. But what it does mean is things that I can't control, I do have recourse. And my false recourse, my faulty recourse has been to say, I do have control over it. No, I'm going to fight for control. I'm going to make it happen. And I'm going to protect myself and do whatever I need to to make this thing happen. So it's always a crisis of faith because we're unwilling to actually relinquish that to God because it's scary. We don't know what God's outcomes will be. We don't know what he's going to do in things. Because we can't say we're not like the prosperity gospel where we can say, oh, well, you know, I, I want good things and therefore God's going to do the good things for me because I wanted that and I asked for that. But this is why Jesus says in today's gospel, at the end of talking about the, the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, he says, O oh, men of little faith. He says, therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat and what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them all. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Do we believe that? That's the crisis of faith. What does he know that you need? Exactly what you need. What is it that you need? You don't know. That is the struggle. You know, we might think, I need to have this job for the rest of my life. And then we get laid off. So it's, it's a very difficult balance. And those are always the struggles, right? Because I say in my mind, I had this thing. It was a known. I could control it. I have it. It's in front of me. And now it's not. And so the anxiety, the fear, the worry come in. And this is where we have to turn back. Who will give me the things that I need? God will. He will. He's promised that. He's promised that he will give you what you need. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. And again, I have to make that qualifier. This isn't the prosperity gospel. Nor is it whatever you want is what God wants. But what our Lord is saying is what you need he will provide. He's made that promise. In fact, he's made that promise by creating you in the first place. 
everything that you need, everything that you need towards salvation, he will provide for you. And this is what he promised. This is the antidote to anxiety, is to place our trust in God. And it's not easy. It's not easy by any means. But the beginning is to recognize I have the anxiety. And so how do I place my trust in God? I don't just say, go do it. Be more trusting in God. Don't you love that advice when you have something difficult in your life and someone says, just trust in God more. It's not easy advice. So what do we do? We repent. This is what we can still do always. We can always turn to God with our anxiety and say, Lord, have mercy on me. I don't trust you. I don't believe that you'll do what is needed in my life and what is good and beneficial in my life. Lord, have mercy. We can say this again and again every single time that the anxiety rises in us. We offer that repentance. And that action will grow our faith and trust in God. But it's not something that you can just kind of force upon yourself. So we always have repentance as the means of growing in our trust in God. For this reason, Jesus ends today's gospel reading with this. He says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be yours as well. All these things. What is everything? It's everything that I need. Even though I don't know what I need, it's everything that I need. But seek first the kingdom of God. This is an important hierarchy. Seek first the kingdom of God, and then these things will come. Why is that the case? Is it he's trying to barter with us? If you seek the kingdom, then I'll give you what you need. No, it's twofold. On the one part, if we're seeking God, then we will receive those blessings more. Not because God doesn't want to give us blessings, but because we become in union with him, in communion with him, our wills become united. Second of all, that in doing this, we begin to see what we actually need. As we draw closer to God, we see what our needs actually are. And this delusion of what I think I need becomes what God sees is needful in my life. And so we see, as our Lord, as St. Paul said, every good and perfect gift, I'm sorry, our Lord, St. Paul said, uh, all things work to good for those who love God. As we grow in our love for God, we see all the good that God does in our lives. Since this is the culmination of the gospel message today, seeking first the kingdom of God, I'd like to finally focus a little bit on three simple ways that we can, simple, ways that we can seek God first. Because there are many ways that we can seek God first. Everything in the life of the church is seeking God. All of our life in Christ. So I'll focus on these three ways. One is in prayers and prostrations. The second is in self-denial. And the third is in being God in God's holy place. Being in God's holy place means being here in worship. We can't draw near to God unless we desire and seek to be in communal worship of God and desire and seek out the receiving of his Eucharist. We should be looking at the, the weekly schedule of the church services and going, there's another chance to receive the Eucharist. I'm going to make sure that my schedule allows for that as much as I can to be there. We should be looking ahead to the schedule because sometimes it takes a week or two weeks to figure things out with our schedule. What's going on that I can be here in worship and receiving the body and blood of Christ? And there are other holy places that we can be. We are so very blessed to have a monastery nearby. How many of you have never been there? Don't raise your hands. How many of you have never been there? Don't even know what I'm talking about. If you're pretty new to our parish, that's a good excuse. St. John the Forerunner Monastery is in Goldendale, Washington. It's two and a half hours away. You could do it in a day trip. I've done that many times. You just go up there. Be in a holy place. If you can go to the services, great. They have vespers in the evening. They have very early morning liturgies. But just being there, being near the church, praying, having a prayerful time, maybe reading a book of spiritual benefit, just go. Being just in the presence of a holy place, 
You know what pious people do in the old country? They go and stop by the church and just light a candle. Now, our church is usually open because we have the school. You have to go through the other door to get there. But think of that. You're just driving by, and you go, I'm going to pull into the church, light a candle, pray for people, walk into this holy place, receive God's grace, and then continue on my way. These are the ways in which we can utilize the holiness that God has given us in his places. The other I mentioned is self-denial, and this can be very broad. This can include fasting. It can include spending time with people we don't want to spend time with. It can include tithing and almsgiving. It can include doing stuff for kids that you never thought you'd have to do. Many ways of self-denial. And God is generous in giving us ways of self-denial. We just have to be equally noticing to take those things up and not deny them. And self-denial should never be as a feat, as a accomplishment. We approach Lent like this sometimes. I'm going to do this during Lent. Should never be as a feat. Rather, it should be a humble recognition of our own enslavement and our desire to be free. Because self-denial is always cutting away at the chains of our slavery. And as we cut away at those chains, we become freed and more able to approach God. Lastly, because I'm getting a little long here, I mentioned prayer and prostrations. And I was specific to say both of those together. Because prostrations are so beneficial. They're the physical act of repentance. We call it a metanya, a repentance. That's what a, pr a prostration is. St. Basil the Great said, Whenever we kneel and then straighten up, we show by action that sin bends us to the ground and the Creator's love calls us to heaven. So do prostrations as much as you can. Include that within your prayer time. It's a wonderful way to start your prayers. Do a dozen or 50 or 100 prostrations, whatever it may be, each time saying the Jesus prayer with that and the sign of the cross. And prayer. There are many things I could say about prayer. I'll offer a few words from Elder Sergei instead. This is actually, this was written by Jean-Claude Larcher, who is a, an Orthodox author of other books. And he says this about Elder Sergei's teaching. He says, the most characteristic trait of Elder Sergei's teaching on prayer is that prayer is living. Not, we can understand that two ways in English. Not prayer is has life in itself, not quite, but that prayer is what living is. He says sometimes that it is the nourishment and the life of the soul, but his favorite and oft-repeated phrase is that prayer is the breath of the soul. This means that it is as important to the life of the soul as breathing is to the life of the body. Just as a man dies biologically if his body ceases to breathe, so too he dies spiritually if his soul ceases to breathe. Only our fallen state and our passions prevent us from realizing this very real fact. Just as one can hardly imagine depriving oneself of life by voluntarily ceasing to breathe, so too it's unimaginable that one gives up one's spiritual life by refusing or ceasing to pray. Now, this is an incrimination for myself and I'm sure for many of us. How much do we have prayer as a seamless part of the days of our life, the hours of our days? Our sense of prayer must not depend on our desires or sense of feeling inspired. Just as we do not breathe of our own goodwill, so too must prayer not be relative to our desire, but something that we do because it is an absolute necessity, something that we have no choice in. Not wanting to pray is a serious sin and reveals that we are in a more general state of sin for which we must ask God for forgiveness. He offers as a final point four things that can help us to overcome our lack of desire for prayer. One is repentance, that we ask God to forgive us for not truly praying, for not wanting to pray, for our lack of zeal. Two, it requires an effort of the will. We have to work at it. Three, it requires patience. And four, it requires rigorous discipline. We must have a prayer rule that we can follow and hold fast to on the days when prayer becomes more weak. 
But brothers and sisters in Christ, this gospel is a gospel to keep and read every day. This is how we can become sanctified, illumined, and be entirely transformed from everything that is around us. Our Lord's given us these words today. Take them up. May he be that consolation against anxiety. May we continue to serve him and seek him first. Amen.